morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever you are in the world today. Uh, so today is uh, January 31st, uh, 2023. Uh, Bitcoin is sitting right around 23,000. We've seen a really great rally, uh, you know, about five, six thousand um, dollars over the last, you know, kind of month, uh, which was surprising. I think a lot of people expected, you know, kind of were, hope, were hoping or thinking or the thought process, we'd see somewhere down around eleven, twelve thousand dollars BTC, and in fact, it hasn't. It's really pushed forward, and, and in the wake of FTX and all the chaos there, um, it's just really nice to see a, a strong and healthy cryptocurrency market, um, which really kind of helps all the developers and all the entrepreneurs uh, to be able to raise fund and gain interest and whatnot. So it's it's while we're not talking about Bitcoin today, um, we are talking about you know blockchain technologies, and, and I've got Yale with me here today uh, from Solid Blocks. Yale, thank you so much. Um, and before we get into to, you know, your current project and what you guys do today, can we go back in time and really understand how you, you got really so interested uh, in blockchain and, and really your first experience of understanding that this is the future? Thank you for having me, Jay. It's really exciting to be here. And um, I love the way you structure your podcasts, you know, kind of getting Thank into you. the background and getting into what, you know, what the company is. It's the, the commercial part, no, just kidding, the podcast. Anyway, so my my interest in blockchain came from my general interest in tech. And as you go through, um, as, a, as, you know, as a VC or as a private equity professional, which I co-founded a VC and I was a part of a, a PE fund and um, I moved to Israel when I was 21 from the U.S., although I'm originally from Ukraine, but I moved from the U.S. to Israel um in 20 in 2005 and i before i moved i read the book the startup nation and mm -hmm. so it explained how israel has turned around from a great you know very agricultural society even with the kibbutz that everybody has heard about um into this tech empire with uh, a huge number of startups on nasdaq it's like number two it used to be maybe now it's number three after US and Canada, um, or, or I don't know what it is, what it is today. Anyway, so when I got here, um, I started joining all these startup groups and then you kind of go through the stages and you had, you know, uh, social media and I had a startup in that space. And then you, know, you, you had um, other uh, iterations of, uh, you know, uh, health data, health AI, and just a, a bunch of different things. And when it got to blockchain, um, uh, around, you know, Bitcoin uh, and then iteration to kind of when the industry understood blockchain can be used for so many things, maybe around 2015, 16. Uh, at that point, I was a part of um, a financial group, a hedge fund um, that was creating funds of funds and doing structured products and all these really fun things, fun being in quotation marks uh, for many people in this industry and, uh, and real estate and so on. Uh, and I was really playing an active role. And for me, it was very interesting. I got to learn about kind of risk of different portfolios and how, in fact, liquidity is created. Like, that's where I got this understanding of um, in order to have liquidity, you have to have like a huge ecosystem involved. You have to have institutions and traders and, uh, you know, some, some places generating demand, some places generating supply, some things ensuring compliance, some things ensuring a platform for, for trading, which only is available to larger aggregated products like indices and ETFs and things like that. That was, in fact, creating these indices and ETFs that institutions and traders would buy. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, was a very, very institutional uh, occupation of mine. Um, and then... When uh, that that fund went down, um, I was like, okay, I just want to get into blockchain because that seems to be uh, a thing that whatever I was doing over there, it seems to be like a perfect, uh, more of a peer-to-peer, -peer, less intermediated um, space or technology or platform or whatever you want to call it um, that would allow doing the same type of financial operations, but um accessible to a lot more people and is you know companies and opportunities and even back then i was thinking like how can we apply this technology to the greater financial world right so um and then i found my way into blockchain through consulting and working on a variety of icos um and marketing you know we had a marketing company um and with seven successful ipos icos sorry and then I realized, like, okay, these ICOs, they're just selling, you know, um, tickets to 
uh, the train that may or may not run. Um, and so um, how do we, you know, securities are no, you know, are here to stay. It's a huge market, private securities market, um, around, you know, $20 trillion, I believe. Um, and even bigger than the public securities market, um, if you're not including all these indices and things like that, or in derivatives, right? Just, just straight up stocks and bonds. And so at the end of the day, we, uh, I was always thinking, how can we place these securities on the blockchain uh, to capture uh, liquidity? But I never thought that just if we put the securities on the blockchain, it's going to create liquidity by itself. Because I was part of the financial markets and capital markets for so long. And like I knew that the only reason why these early ICOs had any liquidity is because two reasons. One is because of the hype. And uh, the set two is maybe there is um, some, you know, the, the, it's just like a startup, you know, Amazon's going on public market, the company's doing well, and there are a few of, very few of those, right? So that's kind of what my background is, deeply financial. I was also a, a part of some startups as an exec um, and um, uh, private equity analysis, marketing, um, but all of yeah. the greater financial. Let's, I mean, that's. Yeah, and that's amazing, and I, I love the story because you understand, and I think that's the biggest challenge that I, one of the biggest challenges I have with Web3 is we have some in incredibly talented and, and just visionary developers that are working on amazing things, but they have no concept of how the world's economics work um that that you know to get to that trillion you know trillions and trillions of dollars um there is massive safeguards there's massive amounts of regulations and i, I there's so many people in our in our in web3 just like a, oh my god regulations and oversight we don't need any of this we're blockchain and every day i read a story about exactly why we need regulations why we need um compliance and 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 not all of the the regulations around securities are bad in fact most of them are there to protect consumers, as you very well know. Um, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm with you there all, you know, all the way. I think regulation poses some barriers, some, you know, and it also poses opportunity uh, in many ways. I think that with technology, securities or regulation can actually move towards providing automated oversight this is what was lacking majorly in most of these um, big scandals like FTX and other things. Instead of focusing on kind of AML, which has largely, I think, been resolved with so much technology, and instead of focusing on uh, a lot of things that I think SEC is focused on, maybe just because they don't understand it, focus on oversight, like uh, not oversight, focus on uh, overseeing um, the operations of, of these ve uh, ventures, like you could, you could have detected things early and prevented this massive disaster from happening. Uh, and that's, I think that technology is going to go that way as well. I, and I completely agree with, with that thesis. And, and the reality is in, in the FTX and Celsius and other worlds, um, you know, it, it's not that it wouldn't happen. It just would have probably gotten caught sooner or been able to be mitigated a little bit more. I mean, let's be clear, you know, even in, in the TradFi world, you know, the Bernie Madoffs and the Enrons yeah. and other things absolutely can implode and, and do. Um, but for every one of those stories, there's there's hundreds, potentially oh, thousands of others that, that regulators stopped yeah. before they got to that point. It's absolutely, it's, by the way, what failed there was the TradFi. The fraud was yep. on the TradFi part. It's, uh, and and the, the, the lending and the, uh, um, and uh, arm's length transactions that were not properly recorded and things like that. And it's just, it's all on the TradFi side. The fact that they used assets that were crypto assets, um, you know, it's just a, just a coincidence, I would say. Not a coincidence because there seems to be a correlation between the risk tolerance of, of entrepreneurs that go into crypto and uh, um, possibly maybe a, a fraud, but maybe not, right? Because look at Bernie yeah. and all the other people. So, yeah. Well, fabulous. So, you know, with, with all that background, and, and again, I got into uh, blockchain right around the same time, you know, I, I Bitcoin right around 2010. Um, and then when Ethereum came out, you kind of just go, okay, well, now we have something that re recognizes uh, the concepts of big data of, you know, all these large databases, uh, CRMs, ERPs, and, and others that, that can utilize this technology very well. Um, you know, but fast forward, you know, eight years to where we are today um, and, and talk about what you've built and uh, how that's going. 
Yeah, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> so we have built with Solid Block a platform that allows to record transactions of securities on the blockchain, uh, which creates several opportunities. The, the easiest one is the tradability um, on the secondary market. That just does not exist today unless you you know, you go public, which doesn't happen with most assets, in fact, unless they're high tech and, you know, high value growth and so forth. You're not going to put a real estate asset on a public market unless it's part of a larger REIT, right? We talked about a structured product. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing. But that's actually, uh, I would say, the lesser thing uh, right now. This, the next stage is really to start collateralizing these securities so that they can be a part of the larger game of lending. That's really the game that moves the value of securities around uh, and creates liquidity. One of the things that creates liquidity because you aggregate a bunch of securities, private securities and into a portfolio and then banks or other non-bank uh, lenders will lend against it. And we have some really cool companies here like TrueFi and Maple Finance that are jumping into the game to collateralize traditional assets on top of the crypto assets, right? And this yeah, lo love Sydney and, and Maple Finance, so they're they're fabulous. Yeah, so so that's that's the next step for us uh, as well. Uh, after that, we believe I believe that it will be the era of the structured product where um, we'll create different portfolios and DCs. Some of that will be homogenous things like let's say real estate. But we've gotten requests for a full portfolio. Let's say, how can we structure it in a way that you can have private securities, but also public securities in the same wallet or maybe even in the same fund? And then maybe some commodities, throw, throw some in there, right? And then, you know, all of that you can <laughs> basically put into a fund of funds. Uh, but usually it's homogenous type of uh, assets that we can now list on a tr traditional exchange or... Um, on some sort of a platform like Morningstar, for example, as, uh, or um, NASDAQ indices and, or just a private, as a private trust and which will be available to institutions to play with uh, when yeah. they need certain risk, right? Yeah. So would you mind um, going through the difference for the viewers between a, a listed and registered security and an unlisted uh, security and what, what the differences between those are related to this? Sure. So Jay, there, there are a variety of uh, traditional or compliant exchanges for, that have a license to trade securities, public securities, publicly listed, so for example, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, right? And so companies can list with them, you know, you, we all at some one point or the other through a, a retirement fund or maybe through Robinhood or Interactive Brokers bought some stocks, uh, Amazon, Facebook. Um, Google and so so forth. Um, some of these exchanges also have a smaller kind of sub exchanges where you can get small, you know, um, o o OTC type of uh, mm -hmm. securities. It's also they're also publicly traded, um, and so so that's that that process is expensive. There's very high regulation that's involved. You need to have a prospectus and so on. And um, there is an alternative for that. If you are a, you know, a smaller company and you don't have a million dollars to invest in that process and you don't have an underwriter, which is basically some, uh, some institution, uh, organization that takes uh, responsibility for, for the race um, and does due diligence, right? If you just want to distribute your, whatever you have, your business, uh, you want to distribute it to uh, investors, it can be even an unlimited number of investors. You just want to distribute it to investors. Um, then you have several avenues to do that through unregistered securities. They're still compliant under certain exemptions. And I'm talking about the U.S. regulation here, but other countries have similar. And so um, one of the very uh, popular ways that you can distribute these unregistered securities compliantly is through an exemption um, that's called Reg D. And it has different subtitles of different numbers uh, that securities lawyers will know. But basically, um, the one that our industry uses the most, the tokenized uh, real estate, the tokenized um, uh, uh, private equity, we will distribute or issuers will distribute 
uh, companies will distribute their securities to only qualified investors, accredited investors, right? Yep. There is, and, and, and that, and, and uh, then they have to check. Uh, these are people that have certain income or certain asset level. You can also use crowdfunding. That's a very popular thing, right? You use crowdfunding, but you have to be a crowdfunding portal for that. You have to have a license. You have to also have certain procedures and then raise up to $5 million. There is a way to raise up to $70 million uh, with some mini prospectus and so on. So all of these things keep lawyers happy, employed, uh, and rich. So um, now in terms of crypto, why is there so much talk about like, oh, will they like in the wake of FTX, will... Uh, you know, will Ethereum be considered a security? Will Ripple be considered, uh, you know, this is a, a, a famous uh, court case, of course. And, you know, yep. um, everybody that issues a financial product, which is what it, what it, what it all is, right? Bitcoin and, um, well, there's obviously an argument whether it's an asset, whether you know, it's a commodity, whether it's a currency, there, there's all these things. And then there's tests to check whether something is a security. And so... In general, in the U.S., they just, uh, you know, just forget it. You know, we, we're, we're, you know, these tests are so complicated. We're just going to assume that all of this stuff is basically a security. And then they gave a few, you know, exceptions. Uh, Bitcoin is just, they have nobody to talk to. So they're like, oh, well, whatever, you know, we'll just yeah, let it. Yeah, commodity. Be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no one, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's it. So we're, um, our company specifically is dealing with private uh, you know, unlisted securities, and um, uh, we, it's a huge market, and uh, it's Massive. going to be growing. It's called alternative assets. When it comes to like big institutions where your pension fund is sitting, they will invest in traditional, which is basically stocks and bonds, and then they'll say alternative, which is like real estate uh, uh, companies, Bitcoin, the, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. That's fabulous. And I really appreciate you taking the time and, and giving a much more thorough, um, you know, and, and correct answer. Um, you know, the, the there's the concept that there are a lot of, you know, especially in crypto, there's a lot of tokens or NFTs or, or DAOs that act like they are um, a, a security, but but they have nothing to stand behind them. So the, the difference between listed and unlisted is very helpful. And then you get into the entire just wasteland of, of chaos, uh, of false marketing and, and international uh, things. So, so thank you for that. So how does SolidBlock and you guys manage these, these unlisted securities and to create a marketplace for liquidity, which is why we're all here? Um, you know, liquidity locked in, in these real estate, in real estate deals um, is, is I, I think, hundreds of trillions of dollars when you add up globally uh, the ability to, to without recapture, re, um, redoing your loans or anything else that you can provide small amounts of liquidity and trading into so many amazing properties. Right. Absolutely. So it's actually a very easy question, but a very complex answer. Um, so let's start with, by uh, just, just, I'll tell you what we do <laughs> and how we do it. So if you have a property and we work with large commercial properties, mainly um, you already let's say you already invested in it built it and then it's just sitting there and um you want to build a new property like what are you going to do so you can always mortgage it in some way refinance it and take some money out that way um and then there's always this equity piece that you're holding or something that you're st still there um so you can go to your friends investors or you know put a the uh, offering together this is what we're talking about issue a security and basically sell them your economic interest, or sell them economic interest in the property, whatever dividend or interest or payout uh, at the end of the period when the building gets sold. So you can basically transfer that to somebody who's willing to pay a little bit of money. They don't have to buy the whole asset and they don't even have to commit to holding that piece of the asset forever because they can now sell it on the secondary market to another individual, either over the counter, wallet to wallet, or in an exchange. Now, because there is a lot of compliance that that allows these unregistered securities to exist, right? Otherwise, it'd be chaos and mayhem and, and things resembling the ICO uh, failures. Um, and so we have to, on a platform level, facilitate that. Like, we have to make sure that everybody who buys these securities adheres to certain laws. So we're talking about KYC, anti anti money laundering and know your customer and so on and so forth. So that's on a very ground level what we do. 
to facilitate just very simply distribution, right? And the distribution. Yep. Yep. Now, does that gonna is is, is the fact that now um, I don't know five hundred three Park Avenue in Manhattan is gonna be on sitting on the blockchain with uh, twenty or thirty investors, let's say that bought into that property. And it's going to be, you know, uh, sitting in their wallets. They're getting their dividends from the rents and so on and so forth. Everybody's happy. Does that mean that all of a sudden there's going to be a huge demand for that property just because now you can buy it in easier and in smaller parts? Maybe, maybe not. Like, I'm not sure that um, people would prefer, you know, once they already bought into something that gives them like 8% return annual and it's pretty stable and it is in Manhattan, there's, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of buildings um and so well not in manhattan but all over the u.s um so will will they sell that and buy something else i'm not so sure um so how will we see this liquidity generated well first and foremost it's already revolutionary that i can even exit like you know i can sell it to my neighbor give it to my kids you know um use it as a collateral to get a loan maybe i won't sell it but i'll you know, go to Maple or TrueFi or, you know, here, here's the security yeah. I bought, uh, collateralize it, give me a loan, which they'll give you like a up to 75% LTV loan to value, right? Um, hopefully, if it's a good and stable security. Because, because it is a, 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 a regulated security. It is a regulated security. Absolutely. They can take ownership of it and they can resell it. Because not only that it's regulated, it's also, the, you know, using... Uh, the mechanisms that are legal and com and compliant to actually peer-to-peer uh, -peer sell the security to other wallets, right? Because otherwise you're stuck with it until the end of days. And if there is no promise of liquidity, you can't you can't use it as a base for a loan, right? Somebody can't take ownership of it. And so in this scenario, because uh, like I'll give you another example, which I think will make everything clear for all the listeners or viewers. Um, if you invested into a startup company, um, there are all these rules under which you usually cannot resell your holding to someone else. Like if you've ever invested in a startup, like um, there's all these uh, right of first refusal, like all these things and hurdles because a startup doesn't want some person to, to some investor to come and own some a piece of it because there are all these rights attached. What we're saying is that it's a passive investment. You put money in, now you're entitled to whatever everybody else is entitled, like it's it's passive income or this and that. And we don't care who owns it, with certain exceptions. Usually we, we want to put on a single wallet, which is usually traced to an owner, uh, owning not more than 20%, right? So there's all, we, all, all these rules that prevent from like a hostile takeover type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we don't care who owns it. So you can use it in whichever way you want. Now, liquidity, though, is going to be generated, like I said, now that you have these electronic, really, uh, products, right, digital products, you don't need a lot to put them together into a trust. Like back in the mm -hmm. day when I was doing this stuff, these had to be publicly listed, and then we had to buy, we had to be a big organization, a hedge fund with licenses that had to buy up all these securities, hold them, we had to have custody license, we had to hold this stuff. Yep. Then we had to place that fund or funds into another vehicle in the UK, put that on an exchange, and as a result, you'll have an like it's and we by having this digital token, we can do all of that in minutes and yep. very cheaply. So now those products, you know, imagine you have like a hundred buildings. Um, that are, you know, all give a certain return and the data is there, meaning there's so much data, more data coming in on the blockchain and it's all verifiable and there's like a whole industry made out of it right now. You can use AI, all the fame, you know, famous chat GPT and other things that uh, right now um, everybody's starting to use to basically kind of, um, you know, analyze whatever is said and then regurgitate you know, uh, valuable insights and things like that, right? So, um, so imagine investors, they will keep getting these, these insights in a, in a form, tangible form, they can understand, oh, like this market's doing that, that market's doing that literally on a minute by minute basis because information processing is just so much easier. So oh, absolutely. Right? Like, think about that. Like, what's going what's gonna to do 
when we combine AI blockchain and and uh, all the all the uh, I wouldn't even call them chatbots. It's just like information generation and and repackaging tools. Sky's the it, limit uh, for individuals that want to trade. Why do you need to be an institution? Why do you need to be J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, and stuff like that? Well, a couple, po yeah, a couple points on that is number one, you know, when when people talk about being inclusive <clears throat> of you know investors and and wanting to be you know more you know have a broader reach uh, into their investments, blockchain solves so many of these issues because there's no right. regional uh, aspect to this. It's it's a global uh, phenomenon. In fact, it'll it'll be you know multiplanetary is is if we ever you know when Elon uh, succeeds on on going to Mars, you know there, there's no reason for for tradfi anymore. And and tradfi I believe will migrate to the blockchain. They they have to. Yeah. Um, because it's a cost savings for them. It's a security savings uh, across mm -hmm. the board, but it's, it's still too early. It's still too young. But the, what, what you're describing, let's just, let's just pretend that 10% of the world's commercial real estate is poof. It's in solid blocks. Um, you know, congratulations, by the way, if that happens. Um, but, but the concept there is suddenly you have the ability for investors, you know, investors that are sitting behind their desk, just like everyone listening to this podcast that has the access to do their own research, to understand, you know, they, they want this state versus that state. They, they want this cap rate versus that cap rate where they can make decisions and have access to, 100,000% more opportunities than they ever can in the world as it is today. Right now, you've got a call broker, and the broker is going to tell you the, the X number of things that he's got listed. Mm -hmm. And if it's listed with someone else, then you're going to go call someone else, and you're going to have to do that over and over again. Uh, okay. Blockchain means that you can work with unlimited amounts of brokers, unlimited amounts of investors, um, and focus in on what you, works Absolutely. best for your theses. And How brokers, do do? Are, and I, I'm happy that you brought up brokers because we are – uh, merging with the broker dealers so, so that we can do a lot more and the brokers are going to play a very important role because um, even now for you the, the disintermediation that's happening uh, really most people don't realize how much is happening behind the scenes in the financial industry and that's what we're talking about when we talk about disintermediation the settlement of deals today is done manually literally people in the bank pressing buttons and entering numbers. There's so many mistakes made and it's insane. Blockchain can do settlement, you know, in, in, with a smart contract, even like automated settlement, right? Um, with record, re, you know, record keeping that is just so proficient and, and effective. So, but the financial industry has this whole servicing and, you know, collections and settlements and like all these uh, crazy financial services companies that people don't even realize that what's happening behind the scenes, and that's why they're paying such high fees for everything, right? Now, the brokerage function of being able to market things and sell things is not going anywhere. In fact, it's becoming even more important because with this wealth of products now that are available to everybody, who's going to bring them to the people? Like, how are you going to connect investors to? Like, if you know, like, let's say Interactive Brokers or Robinhood or even, let's say, Kickstarter, like, how do you find projects? Yep. Well, somebody's curating that stuff for you somewhere, uh, bringing you on the homepage or whatever. There's always uh, these affiliate marketers, of course, and marketers who will know how to find you, know that you really like Midwestern properties or maybe you like uh, space uh, companies, space-related companies, and maybe you like uh, self-driving cars and technologies. So they will know that that's what you like and that's what they're going to bring to you. So at our next iteration, we are making a warehouse of like wholesale deals for brokers to tap into and providing them with basically all of the compliance that they need uh, to uh, sell digital securities and to even get commissions automatically uh, through a blockchain-based waterfall. So that's, that's basically where we believe uh, is going to be the greatest disruption of the industry um, when you'll be able to distribute so efficiently because of these brokers that they know how to sell and they won't need to do anything else. They won't need to do, you know, compliance. They will need to get bugged down on KYC and AML that they still do manually, by the way. So. Yeah. And, and to, and to give everyone an idea in, in the United States, and I don't know what it is, uh, in other parts of the world, but in the United States for residential, we have the MLS multiple listing service, which, you know, if you go on Zillow or realtor.com, you can go see 
98% of, of all the homes that are listed in the United States from, from any portal, and that's accessible through uh, a realtor, a broker, um, you know, a, a website, a marketing company. They all have this even kind of access that if you follow the rules and it, you, can, you can kind of get the, into this massive database, it won't do, dive into it a little too much there, but it's it's pretty clunky and old and old fashioned. But in the commercial space, none of that exists. Um, and even Crexy and some of these other ones, LoopNet, that are you know major large companies, they're, they're still representing a fraction of the commercial uh, commercial industry because most brokers, most you know owners, they're not required to list it anywhere, and quite simply, they don't want to. They like to keep them off off the, on the side of the market. Um, they're not, it's not a technology forward industry in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, moving moving this, you know, going past Web one and Web two, which is they're just going to you know jump right over to yeah. Web three, makes so much more sense than trying to go back to, to yesterday's technology to say, well, we're going to give gated tech, gated access um, to our you know internal servers. Yeah. I, I think that's right on. And I think in general, also, we might want to, we might want a little bit sharpen the understanding of like Web3 and actually Zillow and other um, websites where there are listings happening. Um, uh, some of that is moving, let's say, to the metaverse, which is a better enhanced experience of, I guess, being able to review the products and properties and so forth, which I think is important especially if you are buying a place where you want to live um, yep. or maybe a place where you want to invest because you can get to feel it. And, you know, it's kind of like, I'm actually hoping that that will happen to like grocery stores because I'm still not a hundred percent on kind of buying groceries online. Um, and I don't feel like a hunter gatherer, you know, when I put tomatoes into my basket <laughs> online. So, uh, but that's basically what the metaverse is doing. It's kind of like providing a more intuitive interface and more interactive and things like that. And it's a part of Web3 as in blockchain enables that kind of experience, right? Which is kind of a little bit different than, and blockchain is just technology and it can enable so many different things. And blockchain enables finance, which is not really in my mind kind of a part of the Web3 because that web is just the way that information passes through, right? Uh, although we will, of course, we talked about the way information, uh, and I'm wondering, Web3 and chat GPT, like that's gonna go nuts, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so that's all connected anyway to- into Yeah, and, and, and AI, you know, to it's, it's the hottest thing going right now because, you know, an AI is not a new technology. It's been around for you know, decades at this point, but finally there's been a breakthrough of which, you know, same as, same as everything else. Finally, there's a use case that, that people resonate with and it works and you don't have to be a programmer and you don't have to, it just natural language is where it is. Uh, but, but to me, I've always said blockchain is not designed for humans. <laughs> blockchain is designed for computers and for AI. Um, we can navigate it, we can do it, but the concept is that being able to direct a, a, an AI that you own or that your your company owns or and and direct these these bots, um, they need valid sources of uh, that are immutable, that are that are trusted, validated, and verified to be able to give you back any type of results. And scouring Google, yeah, scouring the open web for these means you just read a bunch of articles that could have been written by anyone anywhere else. So blockchain is a really amazing, uh, you know, kind of merging point for for AI. Exactly, like a validation, like Wikipedia, right? Like, uh, yeah, sometimes I uh, I definitely have to check uh, different sources if it's an important information for a report and stuff like that. And you're right on, like, uh, um, you don't want to double check things and if you want something to be usable in a, in a very secure professional setting, right? Where it's much more than a toy. Um, but yeah, blockchain, we're, we're still going to be surprised by blockchain. And it's one of those technologies that just keeps on giving. Um, there's very, there are very few base baseline, they call them picks and shovels, I guess, picks because you kind of destroy things and shovel is, you know, you dig, I don't know, but these are kind of infrastructure technologies that, um, will give rise to a lot more things and blockchain is one of them. I love that. I love that. So what, what's kind of the next phase for SolidBlocks? So you, you've talked about, you know, kind of expanding a little bit and you're, you're including more institutions, brokers and, and whatnot. Yeah. What's, what's kind of the next big hurdle that, that you need to overcome? So our vision is distributed investment banking and um, that will allow instant 
um, transaction closing, so I would say, you know, if you have to raise a large number, uh, large amounts of money through collaborations of different indicators, brokers, and so on, who will quickly, you know, who will figure out who to distribute it to, join deals together, uh, and so on and so forth. And the reason why I think is the next big thing is because a lot of industries have undergone this um, process with the rise of the internet, right? So the internet was the catalyst for affiliate marketing of things like sneakers or, you know, uh, pretty much every product. That's why let's say Kylie Jenner got so uh, popular uh, and, uh, and then uh, a billion dollar entrepreneur because she knows how to use social media, creates a decent product and, um, and uh, has a bunch of affiliate marketers, right? Uh, who will resell and get a commission. Now, in the securities industry, you cannot get a commission unless you're a broker. And as a broker, it's very difficult to collaborate with other brokers because there's so many rules. And so this type of marketing of securities was just impossible. You can do a two level, right? You can maybe hire, if you're a guy who was hired in a deal, maybe you're busy, so you're gonna hire another guy or a girl and then that's it right you cannot have a bunch of different layers you cannot hire 10 people you can you know um to help you out and so that just was not a way to distribute uh, and so only the big investment banks are really good at distribution because they have a lot of a lot a, a big a big networks and they can take a lot of money for it and they will only take products that are very big now with our setup smaller products will get distributed, right? <clears throat> if you only have a 10, $20 million deal, maybe even a $5 million deal eventually, you'll be able to join as opposed to right now when nobody cares if you have, you know, if you go to a VC, some certain VCs or institutions as a startup, they're like, we would love to, but we don't have a mandate to put less than $20 million in you. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's how things are. And we are going to change that. We're going to change the way money flows, uh, change the, uh, the need for intermediaries in the markets. And as a result, uh, create a much more efficient way to, to distribute private securities and money, uh, as a result, liquidity should be cheaper, um, especially in situations when there's crises, right? Hopefully we're kind of getting out of one. We mentioned the Bitcoin, Bitcoin going up a little bit uh, unexpectedly. Um, as we, we thought it might go down, but the, the truth of the matter is that the markets are improving. When the markets are improving, all of a sudden exits happen and there's a, or, you know, there's a little bit more money. And then where do people put that money while well, they're looking for their other investment? Well, the most liquid assets. So Bitcoin is going to benefit from any sort of like a jump in the market, in my view. Um, so, you know, we're benefiting from it and let's hope that the markets will continue to recover until the elections at least. And take advantage of this opportunity. Sorry, none of this is investment advice. No, no, yeah, no, no investment advice ever on the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, Al, I, really amazing conversation, and and I love your insights and and your you know eagerness to correct me uh, on, on some incorrect terminology that I have here. And so I really appreciate that because education is one of our, our top uh, challenges that we have in this industry. Uh, people say that they understand cryptocurrencies and blockchain, and then you talk to them for a few minutes, you realize they have no concept of what's actually occurring. Um, just because it's on blockchain doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's the wild west and you can do whatever you want, wherever you want. Um, there are still rules that have to be followed. It's a New technology, just like MP3s and, and peer to peer, uh, kind of helped Napster to to become the evolutionary gateway to Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music. You know, we're seeing kind of the the initial concepts of of the early EVM chains like uh, Ethereum and, and others that are now giving the rise to companies like Solid Blocks and giving you guys the ability to scale and grow grow in ways that would have cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in the past to have the levels of access and the levels of, of kind of security and, and distribution that you have today. With that all being kind of said, and we understand that, where do you see this, this industry and this asset class going um, that you would give, you know, kind of thoughts to other entrepreneurs that are, that are in the space kind of wondering where all this is going? Sure, Jay. So we talked about how blockchain is the picks and shovels uh, type of technology, which is used for a variety of things and i would say it has three primary functions um obviously it's a ledger so you record transactions you know anything transactional 
Um, number two, I would say, it, so beyond the transactions, you have the capability to collaborate and bring data in. So it's, it's still a transaction, but uh, not necessarily the, the, the process of moving of one asset to, to between different places and wallets, but actually being able to aggregate uh, a lot of things from different parties. And so I, I think these are kind of like the two main attributes. Uh, and maybe the third one is value, is being able to value things easily. So let's think about different ways to bring that together into one, uh, into kind of a direction for new entrepreneurs and people that are sitting there, you know, developers that are saying, well, I, I know how to do AI, let's say, and, uh, you know, I've been dabbling into in smart contracts, and, you know, or I know, you know, language processing, um, or, or I'm taking a course in machine learning and I do this, or maybe I am a mechanical engineer, uh, what can I do? Or maybe I'm a pharma exec, I'm not even a dev, right? I, I just uh, see so many problems that I want to solve. So people that, um, that look at, at this from the problem perspective instead of the solution kind of, okay, where can I now apply blockchain? Um, they will reasonably find that to improve existing networks and processes that are already based online and data collection and, um, and uh, uh, AI, most of these places blockchain can, can really um, make things more efficient, right? So uh, in this case, you wouldn't be wrong by saying we, blockchain can do this better, right? I would not necessarily look at things like, you know, e-commerce, although that I've, I've seen, a, I've seen good, uh, also good solutions there. So I shouldn't say, uh, but I, I would not necessarily look at kind of, uh, uh, like things that were popular back in the day is again, these tickets to write sort of things like, okay, mm -hmm. let's put blockchain in so we can raise some money, um, uh, through the blockchain uh, and put a token. So I think that kind of is fast and the technology has evolved into a tool that makes things cheaper transactions, the aggregation gives permissions, right? So we're talking about permissions. Let's say we have a bunch of pharma companies that want to trade patents or technologies, right? So, so that's still not solved. Even the records on the blockchain for hospitals are not sold. Why? Because of the UX. If you are a UX specialist and you are so good at making things simple, right? Then yes, please. we need you here um, to, to, and, and also I would advise just in general, don't try to move any corporate to a new platform and make them change the way they're doing things. Um, it's super difficult. Make them change one thing that is so painful to them and they hate it. Like in our case, for example, brokers hate doing KYC, ML, hate all this manual work. You know, give me that. If I told them, just move to our platform, from now on, you're going to do everything on them. They're going to be like, forget it. Um, so just change a little bit, make enough value so that later on you, you grab even more and more and more and more of what they do, right? If they're your client, know your client so well. Um, and blockchain, by the way, to, and a lot of entrepreneurs tend to jump industries. Today, they're going to do this. Tomorrow, they're going to do this. In my mind, I think it will not take... It, you know, take you no less than three years to really, really learn your customer and the industry. Like, that's why I really like people that kind of worked in something like, let's say, automotive engineers uh, for 20 years. And then they, they create a startup and then they're like, OK, now they do know everything in and out. And they, re, you know, they, they got this idea how they can use new technology because they, you know, that came on the scene. So tech is what tech is what changes. The industries yeah. take a really, really long time to change. And, and I completely agree with, with everything you just said, because I want more people that have institutional knowledge of the way it is today and yeah. solve the, the pain problems that we already have with the existing systems that are already in place. So I love that concept. Um, and I, and I and, you know, realize that we wrap this up, you know, I love that you are attacking um, commercial, you know, real estate, which is very different than residential real estate. You know, we, I own a, a residential uh, brokerage. And we've come across a couple of titles that have been, you know, migrated to the blockchain. Let me tell you, the first thing that happens when we have a buyer interested is we have to undo 
that because there's no lender, there's no, you, you title won't, won't process it. And so the concept is sound like, sure, the title's there and you can find it all on chain, but if there's no marketplace, if it's not an accepted marketplace and you're not following the regulations that the existing industries have, you've created a, a solution to a problem that didn't exist. Um, so I really love, you know, what you're doing with solid blocks. I love everything uh, that we just talked about. And I thank you so much for the time. Um, if people are interested in one or and more, what's the best way to find you? So soloblog.co is a place and I am, you know, Google Yell Tamar. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, whatever platform I exist on. And, you know, I'll always answer and talk to anybody who's interested in kind of joining us. And we have um, quite a, now we actually have a big opportunity for any brokers to come and join us and for any investors uh, to come and join us. Um, so you know, let us know what, what you'd like to do and we'll collaborate. Love it. Fabulous. Uh, y Wills, this is Yale from uh, Solid Blocks. Uh, highly suggest checking out the platform and really following along. Uh, you guys are, are doing some great updates on LinkedIn and others. So thank you for the time and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for having me, Jay. Anytime. What's up, Not Just Developers? Welcome back to a new live stream. And I'm super excited about today's build because we are continuing the application that we started previous week. And here I'm talking about the WhatsApp clone. So, previous week we have.